Well, hey, let me invite you to grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 23. Psalm chapter 23. As you are turning there, I want to say thank you for your prayers and your encouragement to me and to my family. We are getting settled in here in Conroe and settled in here uh, at West Conroe Baptist Church. It's been a hectic, wild, chaotic few weeks, uh, but the Lord has been with us, and we know that your prayers have been with us as well, so we thank you for that. I'm still learning my way around our campus, and uh, Brother Dave doesn't know this, but about 30 minutes ago, I almost texted him and said, hey, can you get three or four more songs queued up? Because I had to send him that text locked in one of our stairwells over here in the office area. <laughs> I'm still learning what doors lock behind me when I walk through them. And I kid you not, I was locked in one of our stairwells. So I frantically called my wife. She said, I'm in life group. What do you need? I said, I need help. Uh, <laughs> can you come down to this door? And so she gets to the door and her first instinct was not to, you know, open the door and release me. Her first instinct was to take a picture of me through the glass. So she has the picture to prove I am not making this up. I really was locked in a stairwell. Um, so it's good to be standing before you here this morning. Um, Psalm chapter 23. Last week, we started a three weeks, a three week service looking at Psalm 23, looking at the good shepherd. As a new shepherd begins here at West Conroe Baptist Church, I thought it would be important for us to look at and to think about the true good shepherd here in Psalm 23, of course, Jesus Christ himself. And so last week, we talked about the fact that the good shepherd provides for us, that because the great I am is our shepherd, we have what we need. He will meet every need that we have. Today, we're going to look at the next verse here in Psalm 23, Psalm 23, 4. And today, I'm going to do something that I don't think I've done in over 10 years of preaching, and that is to preach a single sermon on a single verse. And generally, it's not recommended that you try out new things on your second Sunday with the new church, but we're going to have some fun today. We'll see how it goes. Psalm 23, we're going to look specifically at verse 4. So let me invite you, if you're able to stand where you're at, I'm going to read this verse over us this morning. Uh, last week when I did this, I shared that I, I really believe that this is God's word, that when we open the word of God, we open the voice of God. This is God's breathed out word. It's the basis of our faith. It's our standard for what is true and right and beautiful. We have it here in God's word. And I just like to affirm that as your pastor week in and week out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this verse for us. And then I'm going to affirm that we believe this is the word of the Lord. And when I'm done reading and when I affirm that this is the word of of the Lord. If you're there with me, if you believe and trust that this really is God's word, I'm going to ask you to respond like this. Thanks be to God. So let me read this. I'll affirm what we believe, and then you respond with thanks be to God. Listen to Psalm 23, verse 4. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I will fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod is and your staff, they comfort me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, you may be seated. I shared last week that, uh, or I shared that last week, we started this three-week service, or three-week series, looking at the fact that the good shepherd uh, provides for us. Today, we're going to see that the good shepherd protects us. Next week, we'll see that the good shepherd prepares us. Last week, we looked at this truth that the good shepherd in Psalm 23 is none other than God himself. And that language of the shepherd is later applied to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And what I want us to see today, your takeaway thought this morning is this, that the good shepherd protects his people through his presence and his power. I'll say that again. The good shepherd protects his people through his presence and his power. 
And to look at that here in verse four, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into three phrases. And we'll unpack each one of those phrases as they come in verse four. Right at the beginning of verse four, David, the author of this psalm, he's gonna, he's gonna paint a picture for us. He's gonna create this setting and he's gonna bring us into this setting. And it's a dark setting. It's a bit of an ominous setting. And yet what we'll see through these phrases in Psalm 4 is that even in the darkest of valleys, our good shepherd protects us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, your good shepherd will protect you. And so we're going to get right to work in Psalm 23, verse 4. I want us to look at this first phrase again that helps us understand that the good shepherd protects his people through his presence and his power. Look back in your Bibles. Verse 4 begins like this. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. It's the first phrase I want us to look at, think about, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. Now, if you have any familiarity with Psalm 23, if you've heard it read or even sung the words to this psalm, you will probably recognize the phrase, even when I go through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's a, a very typical, good, faithful way to render this verse. The Christian Standard Bible renders it as the darkest valley. It's an interesting phrase in the original language. That phrase is translated a couple different ways throughout the Old Testament. So it can be understood as the valley of the shadow of death or here, the darkest valley. Job chapter 24 renders and translates this phrase as deep darkness. And so you can understand how all of these things are driving at this idea of, of a dark valley of this, this, this sense that death is just overshadowing everything, this season of immense trial and suffering, this is what this particular phrase is driving us to. Now, valleys for shepherds in this day, of course, David himself was a shepherd. He had firsthand experience. Valleys for them were very real geographic features that shepherds had to navigate their flocks through. These were dangerous places because they didn't know who or what was in those valleys as they took their flock through that valley, but it was almost never anything that was safe or helpful to the flock. These valleys were the preferred hangouts of thieves and bandits and predators and other threats. And so the shepherds had to navigate their flock through this valley and they couldn't pull out their iPhone or Google Maps and type in the shortest route without tolls in order to get to the other side, right? They had to walk through whatever was in front of them. They were doing this without flashlights and radar and any of the tools that we have that we can use to navigate. No, they had to go through these dark valleys and they had to protect their flocks as they did so. Now, of course, this isn't talking about you and me physically walking a flock of sheep through some massive valley, but this is talking about those seasons of life, those situations of life that you and I walk through where everything around us is just choking us out in darkness, where we're going through severe suffering, some sort of trial. Uh, perhaps it's related to physical death, but it's not limited or limited just to, to physical death. This can be suffering of, of many different types. And you know very well what I'm talking about. You have likely been there. In fact, in a room this size this morning, I'm sure that somebody is in the middle of a valley right now. And so he says, even when I go through these seasons, even when I go through this place in my life, I will fear no danger. Now, before we keep going, there's a really important connection that I want you to see and that I want you to make between verses three and, verses, and verse four. This is really important for us to understand something uh, from this text about Christianity, about the Christian life. So look back in your Bibles. Do you remember 
what the good shepherd does back in verse three. In other words, what, what, is, what is the job description? What is one of the responsibilities of the good shepherd in verse three? Well, you'll notice that one of the things that the shepherd does is that he leads me along the right paths. Okay, so there, there are these paths that Jesus Christ leads me down. He carves them out for me, all right? Others might go down the wide path that leads to destruction, but Jesus calls us to follow this narrow path that leads to life. And so we walk this narrow path with Jesus leading us that way. But notice then in verse four, we see, okay, but that right path sometimes goes through the darkest valley? Can that be right? Because what happens is sometimes you and I think when we get to a season of suffering or we encounter a trial, our first reaction is to say, well, God, you, you must have missed the turn somewhere. Like, what, this, is the, this is the place you don't want me to be, God. But notice what the text says, that even when we follow the right paths, sometimes those paths walk directly into the darkest valley. I think of the disciples uh, back in Mark chapter four, when Jesus gets his guys together and he says, we're gonna go on to the other side of the sea. And Jesus knew what awaited them on the sea. In fact, he kind of created it and he brought this massive storm to bear, but the disciples didn't know that's what they were getting into. Jesus did, Jesus gets them into the boat and he knows he's going to stir up this massive storm that they're gonna sail right into. This, like, this was part of Jesus's plan. And the reason Jesus did that is because he knew that they were going to learn something about who he was as a result of that storm that they would not learn had they not gone through it. And so sometimes, yes, following the right path of Jesus Christ brings us directly into the teeth of a storm and sometimes directly into the darkness of the darkest valley. Okay, that, that is not a bug of Christianity. That's a feature. Like that's built in to our faith. But notice this is so encouraging. Right? You say, how, Jesse? I'm not tracking so far on the encouragement. Hang with me. Because what this means, verse four in particular, what it means is that when we experience these dark valleys, our first instinct should never be well, God has abandoned me. Our first thought should never be God has forgotten me. He's got other more important things to take care of, so he's left me all alone. That, that should never be our first instinct when we encounter suffering because sometimes God pulls us directly into valleys. So rather, our first reaction should be something along the lines of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which says this, he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion. When we go through suffering, we trust that God, you're doing something good in this. You will bring good out of this somehow. I might not even see it on this side of eternity, but I'm trusting that you're going to bring this to completion. The good work that Christ begins in you and the good paths that he has you on, sometimes those feel really ominous and really dark. And yet we can trust that our shepherd will protect us even there. Listen, you may be in one of those today. But remember, if you are a believer, you have not been forgotten. Your good shepherd protects you. Perhaps God is using this valley, this season, this trial. Perhaps he's using it because he wants to reveal something to you about his own character, about who he is in this season, just like he did with the disciples. Perhaps that's what he's bringing you into this valley for. Or maybe he wants to refine you in some way. Maybe he wants you to release a sin that you've been holding onto and he's going to use this trial to help you release that sin. Maybe he wants to reignite and reinvigorate your prayer life. I don't know what it is, but I do know this, that even Christians are not immune to dark valleys. Even Christians are not immune to dark valleys. In fact, I'm thankful that Christianity has a category for this. 
like that it names that sometimes we will walk through suffering. Sometimes we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm thankful that Christianity doesn't just sort of wave away suffering or evil or try to downplay it, but it's very realistic about the real challenges of life. Today, you may be here and, and, and you might be in the middle of a valley and you might be asking, Jesse, does Christianity have anything to offer someone who's suffering like me? Does this Jesus stuff really make a difference in the middle of my suffering? You might be asking yourself that today. And I would humbly respond like this. I would say, yes. In fact, Christianity alone offers this bedrock, steel grade hope for when we walk through valleys, because only Christianity makes sense of the suffering that we see around us and the suffering that we walk through. Christianity owns that we live in a fallen world, and so we will go through valleys. But the good news of the gospel and the good news of Psalm 23 is that even then, that our shepherd protects us. We also know that one day Christ will make all things new. One day we know that Christ will wipe every tear. We know that the suffering we're experiencing now is not the end of all things. In fact, I think we see that with a single small word in Psalm 23. It's a small word, but it's a word that bursts with hope. Look back in your Bibles, Psalm 23, 4. Even when I go through the darkest valley, that little word is powerful. There's power even in the prepositions of God's word. This word through, you know what it means? It means that the valley is not final. It means that the trial and the suffering that you might be facing is not final. It is not the end. Christ will redeem all things. The valley is dark, but it is not final. It's not that God brings us to the valley and then he just leaves us there to fend for ourselves. We go through it, but we don't end there. So take hope in that because Christ is making all things new. And because Christ is leading us through it, we can trust him now in it. Which brings me to our next phrase. Look back in your Bibles. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. Phrase number two, here it is, for you are with me. Why can we walk through seasons of suffering and valleys of the shadow of death? Why can we walk through those and fear no danger? Well, that little four is important because it says, for you are with me. In other words, I can walk through with confidence on the basis of the fact that you're with me, Lord Jesus, that you have not sent me out on my own, but that you are beside me, for you are with me. Now, commentators on Psalm 23 will often point out what I'm about to point out to you. Hebrew writers, Hebrew poetry in particular, it, it, it loaded or it emphasized the main idea, the main point, the main phrase, sometimes even the main word. Like if the writer wanted you to catch what the main point is, what, what are the flashing lights on the billboard that the writer wants you to see, what Hebrew poets would do, and we see this even in the scriptures, is that they would put that right in the middle of the psalm. So for you and me, when we read a book or when we watch a movie, usually it's at the very end where there's a big reveal, right? That's kind of the turning point of the movie. Of the movie. Maybe there's a, a, some sort of moment that kind of makes everything click at the very end of a movie. Well, that's not how Hebrew poets and that's not how the psalms work. They don't wait till the end to emphasize the main point. They do it right in the middle. And so... The question should be, okay, well, what is the middle of Psalm 23? Well, you guessed it. It's a single phrase, and it's this phrase, for you are with me. 
If you were to look at the poem in the original language, you can even see this in your English translation, that that phrase, for you are with me, that is the very middle of the psalm. And that's because the writer wants everything to work up to that. That's the crescendo. And then everything flows from that. The, 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 the flashing lights here is the fact that our shepherd is with us. That is what the writer wants us to see. And so when we walk through a valley, our fear can fade when we remember who it is that's with us. Remember back in verse one, this is the Lord who is walking beside me. There is nobody who threatens his authority or his power. He owns all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the one who's walking beside you through your valley if you know him as savior and Lord. That alone should just cause our fear to kind of be right-sized and put in the right place. It's because who's walking with us? Notice nothing about the narrator, David himself here. There's nothing about David that gives him self-confidence as he walks through the valley, right? It's not his skill set or his ability or his experience or his fortitude or his strength or whatever. There's nothing about David here that kind of gives him self-confidence. His confidence is not found internally. His confidence is found in someone outside of himself. That is the good shepherd. This is God himself. Confidence is not found in ourselves, our strength or our thoughts. Those are insufficient to eliminate the darkness around us. Confidence is found in looking at our shepherd, remembering who he is and reminding ourselves and one another that he's with us, even in our valleys. This gets back to the main takeaway thought that the good shepherd protects his people, how? With his presence, for you are with me. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. And then I want us to look at this last phrase, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's the final phrase I just want to spend a minute or two on. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So about 13, 14, 15 years ago um, or so, when I would go see, go visit Marissa, on the campus of UT Arlington. I would have to drive across campus or walk across campus to see her in the evenings. We would hang out, watch a movie. Uh, We ate a lot of Panda Express because that was there on campus. Um, We would just walk around campus, hang around friends. Often when I would show up at her door, uh, she would see me holding a very large bat bag with some eye black still underneath my eyes and with my wrists still taped. Uh, Hopefully I wasn't still wearing my spikes, but you know, some sort of sandals on or something because I went directly from baseball practice to her dorm. And so that's how she would greet me. She would see me in my practice uniform, my equipment, you know, eye black, taped wrists, kind of the whole nine yards. Why? Well, because that's the tools that I was using as a student athlete. You say, Jesse, weren't you a student athlete? Where were your books? Where were your studies? They were somewhere, but um, I was usually carrying around baseball stuff. Why? Because those were the tools that I was working with. Now, if I showed up to our house today wearing those same tools, she would look at me like I was a crazy person. She, she would say, listen, man, the glory days are way in the past. They're in the rear view mirror, man. Give it up. So no, that's not the way she sees me today because those aren't the tools that I use today. She and our children see me walk through the door with a backpack and a laptop and a Bible and some commentaries and a phone that I'm replying to people on. Why? Because those are the tools that I use in my everyday life. If she sees me walk through the door with a measuring tape and a power drill, she says, "Uh oh, because she knows those are not natural tools for me, right? As much YouTube videos as I watch, I'm still not real skilled with those things. Some of you, those are your natural tools and praise the Lord, right? But what a person uses on a day-to-day basis in terms of their tools tells you a lot about who they are. 
In fact, if I didn't know you at all and I came up to you and I, and I said, hey, kind of list out five or six items that you use every single day. And I had no idea what your occupation was. I had no idea what your hobbies were. But if you said, here are three, four, five, six things that I use every single day, I could probably get pretty close to knowing what it is that you do for work and what you like to do for fun. Why? Well, because the tools that we use and the tools that we handle tell us a lot about somebody's life. And that's true for our good shepherd as well. Because when we look here at the very end of verse four, when we see your rod and your staff, they comfort me, what the rod and the staff are, are tools of the shepherd. These were physical, real tools that the shepherd would use in order to protect and guide his flock. Not only are these just simple tools, in fact, more specifically, these are weapons that a shepherd would use to protect his flock. In fact, you can still go to different places around the world and you can see shepherds still carrying around weapons to protect their flock. Now, the, the technology has been upgraded a bit, but shepherds still protect their flock with these different tools, with these weapons. And that's what we see here, our good shepherd holding. This is Jesus Christ. This is an illustration of him protecting his people. This is not a tame shepherd. So if when you think of Jesus, some kind of tame, airy, you know, picture of a man laying on this grassy hillside, if that's the picture that comes to mind of Jesus Christ, get rid of that. This is our Savior and Lord, the King of Kings, our, our King who protects his people, and he uses these tools. Now, the first tool that's mentioned here is the rod, and this was an offensive weapon that the shepherd would use to fend off any sort of threats against the flock. You could go back and look at a place like Psalm chapter two, and you would see language of God using his rod to ultimately destroy all of his enemies. This is a tool that the shepherd would use to protect the flock. And we can take great confidence in the fact great comfort in the fact that Jesus will protect his people using this rod, right? If God is for me, who can be against me? The fact that vindication is the Lord's and he can take it up and it's not mine to take up, that gives me great comfort because I don't have to carry the rod, he does. And so he'll protect me and he'll protect his people. He protects us with his power. But there's two tools in verse four, aren't there? Why are there two listed here? It's a good question to ask. There's a reason that he gives us the rod and the staff. The rod is this offensive weapon to protect his people. But the staff, on the other hand, it was used to guide and to redirect the sheep not as a tool against the sheep, but a tool to redirect and kind of shepherd the sheep through this valley. Because here's what would happen. Obviously, scared sheep, once they got into this dark valley, scared sheep at times would run and hide. Or they would get confused and they would wander off. Or they would say, you know what? I think I know better than my shepherd does, so I'm gonna go off on my own way and do my own thing. And so the shepherd has this tool where he's constantly bringing the sheep back onto the narrow way. This is another way that the shepherd protects the sheep. He uses this tool to direct them and draw them back into the flock because here's what we know, that the sheep could be just as much as a th of a threat to themselves as any sort of external threat would have been to them. They could have been a threat to themselves because they rejected the voice of the shepherd or they got off on their own way. So the shepherd has these tools to draw them back in. And I want you to listen to 
what a writer named David Gibson says about these tools, because I think it really drives it home to our lives today. As we think about how God uses these tools in our lives, this is a a lengthy quote, but you'll be able to track with it. And I think it's so helpful to understand how God uses these tools in your life and in mine. Listen to what David Gibson says. He says, some of us want Jesus to protect us from our enemies with his rod but we don't want Jesus to protect us from ourselves with his staff. We like the idea of Jesus coming down hard on others. We are less enamored when he reaches us personally and he directs us somewhere we don't want to go. But what is my greatest enemy right now? Well, it is my own sinful heart my love of myself, my self-pity, my distorted belief that the grass might be greener somewhere else, or my deeply twisted, subtle belief that the path of righteousness might not be the path of happiness. And then he concludes like this, oh, how I need Christ's staff in my life to be, to continually pull me back to him. The Lord still uses his staff to redirect us and guide us back to the narrow path. By the way, this is what local church pastors, local church shepherds continue to do. We protect the gospel. We protect the sheep from false teaching, and we direct the sheep back to the narrow path. Even when sheep balk at that effort, our job is to continually protect the gospel and protect the sheep, even from their own sinful decisions and desires. And by the way, in the healthiest of churches, church members are doing this work together for one another. They're encouraging one another. They're drawing each other back into faithfulness to Jesus Christ. This morning, even as I'm saying these words, you might feel the pull of the shepherd's staff back into the narrow path. There might be a sin in your life. It might be a sin of of anger, or it might be a, a lie that you're caught up in. Uh, It might have to do with some level of immorality. Whatever it might be, you might be sensing the shepherd saying, release that, flee from that. My encouragement to you this morning is don't press back against that. Don't, Don't reject that. That's the shepherd graciously loving you, pulling you back in. We call this conviction. So if the Lord is bringing conviction to you this morning, understand that as his protecting you and drawing you back to the narrow path. So the Lord protects his people in their dark valleys with his presence, for you are with me, and his power, his rod, and his staff. But I want to point out one thing. Hang with me just for a few more moments. There's a final reason that you can trust the shepherd in your darkest valley. And that reason is is because Jesus himself, our good shepherd, Jesus himself, he has already walked through the darkest valley imaginable so that you could be restored, you could be rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of everlasting light. That's what Colossians 1 tells us. He has walked through that darkest valley so that you can be forgiven and you can know hope and you can find freedom. And that darkest valley took place on a hill called Golgotha when the entire world swallowed Jesus in darkness as he was absorbing the wrath that you and I deserve because of our sin. He walked through that darkest of valleys so that you can know the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He took your punishment upon himself and he clothed you in his righteousness there through the cross and the empty tomb. If you will repent of your sin, meaning turn from your sin and trust in him as Lord and savior. Jesus himself subjected himself to the weapon of the cross so that you could find spiritual peace so that you could know eternal peace. And he did that through his life, his death, and his resurrection, dying in your place, and then rising again, stomping on the head of darkness forever when he walked out of the tomb. And today he says, if you've never put your faith in Christ, then you can know him today. You can know him as your shepherd. In fact, in just a moment, we're gonna sing a final song of response 
and I'll be down here. We'll have some counselors down here, easily accessible. We'll have some deacons available. If you just need somebody to talk with, you just make a beeline to us because we want to tell you about how you can know this shepherd personally, how you can know this shepherd as Lord and Savior of your own life. Why can you trust Jesus in your valley? Well, it's because he's already gone through the valley of the shadow of ultimate death so that you, friend, can know ultimate everlasting life. If you can trust him with your eternity, which I pray you do, you can trust him in your valley today because he's leading you through it. He's not leaving you in it. We can trust him because according to Psalm 139, even the darkness is not dark to him. It's dark to us, but it's not dark to him, so we trust him. And because he's overcome the grave and evil and eternal danger, you need not fear. Because the shepherd protects his people by his presence and by his power.